Hello, Hey Boomer listeners. Welcome to the Hey Boomer Show. And if you have not been here before, my name is Wendy Green. I am the host of Hey Boomer. And Hey Boomer is a show that brings you interesting, intelligent conversations with thought leaders and scientists and educators and entertainers. And we talk about ways to enhance your um, enhance your sense of purpose. We talk about ways to f- make a difference. And we talk about ways to stay engaged as we age. And so if those are all things that are of interest to you, then I am so glad to have you join us today on Hey Boomer. <laughs> Boom chicka boomer. Thank you, David Bell. <laughs> um, so our guest today, Dr. Mary Flett, she and I met on Instagram, which is a platform that neither of us feel like we have mastered, but we are learning and trying. And it is, um, I don't know, I'm not even sure who reached out first, but I have to tell you, it is my great privilege to have met her. And it is my even greater privilege to bring her to the Hey Boomer audience. Uh, You're going to love her story. Um, Dr. Mary is really on a mission to help us all find ways to age better to age with finesse, as you will hear about some of the books that she's written, and to, you know, find meaning and purpose in this next stage of our lives. Before I bring her on, I wanted to talk about our never too old stories for this week. I have two good ones for you, I think. The first one, I want to tell you about John P. Weiss. John is a retired police chief with over 26 years of experience with the Scotts Valley, California Police Department. He also has been an editorial cartoonist for the Santa Cruz County Sentinel and the Press Banner newspapers. But in 2017, after retiring, John reinvented himself as an artist and a writer. I subscribe to his Saturday newsletter, John P. Weiss, is the name of the newsletter. And if you are interested, um, drop me a note at wendy at heyboomer.biz and I'll be happy to send you the link for that. Anyway, in his Saturday newsletter, he shares his writing, artwork, and some cartoons. And his desire is to entertain, inspire, and help his readers get more out of life. Sounds a little familiar, right? So I'm hoping that I can have him on as a guest one day. My second never too old story is going to be a guest. Her name is Helen Hirsch Hirsch Spence, and she is the founder of Top 60 Over 60. Helen um, is going to be a guest in January, and she founded Top 60 Over 60 in 2017 to bring attention to the many talented older workers who had been sidelined because of their age. In Helen's former life, she was the headmistress of a private school. So she uses her background in learning as well as her strategic and leadership skills to advocate for older people. As both Helen and John show us, we are never too old to reinvent ourselves. One more thing before I bring Dr. Mary on, I do have a favor that I'm continuing to ask of you. Um, I would really like it if you all would go to Hey Boomer on the Apple Podcasts on iTunes and like the podcast and write a review. That would be even better. Um, The more reviews, the more likes that you get on the Apple iTunes podcast the higher your uh, rating becomes and the more people that will be able to find us and the more people that we can bring into the Hey Boomer community and help to find ways to stay engaged in life. So I would appreciate if you would do that. And now I'm going to bring Dr. Mary on. Hello there. So Hi, glad, Wendy. So glad you're with us today. I feel exactly the same way. How are you, Boomer? (laughs) 
I am good, Dr. Mary. Let me tell them just a little bit about you. And then we will start in with the questions. So Dr. Mary recently retired from private practice as a clinical psychologist, providing services primarily to aging adults. And after 20 plus years in private practice, along with working as a crisis intervention specialist, research assistant, quality improvement specialist, and program manager in three different counties in California, <laughs> she has turned her life's work into the five pillars of aging, helping all of us to age better and age well. And she has also written a weekly blog for the Center for Aging and Values for the past four years. And a collection of these blogs has recently been published as a three book series, Aging with Finesse, available on Amazon and at your local bookstores. And in addition to her writing, Dr. Mary is a nationally recognized speaker on aging. And we were trying to play with how to show you some of the books with finesse, right? So that's the first one. That's the second one. And that's the third one. And you can see I have my little bookmarks in there. So, <laughs> so we'll talk about those. But first, as I read in your books, and I listened to some of your other interviews. Um, I found out that you were an activist as a young woman, and you um, have a grandfather who was very inspiring to you. So if you could kind of give us briefly your origin story, I would really appreciate that. First of all, thank you so much for having me on Hey Boomer. I, I am finding such joy in connecting with people who are doing the exact same thing that I'm doing right now, which is in some ways reinventing myself, but more than that, embracing the opportunities that I'm finding are available to me mm -hmm. right now. So my origin story, um, you know, growing up, grew up in Chicago in the early 1950s, I'm adopted. And I, I jokingly say, although this is fact, that I was adopted from the Chicago Foundlings Home, which in my mind, uh, especially at this time of year, I have this infant in swaddling clothes imagined, um, along with a variety of other uh, movie-themed adventures going on. The truth of the matter is, I grew up in a lovely middle-class suburb of Chicago. I had advantages that so many of us, I think, growing up in a city environment had access to museums, access to great art. And I had a family that encouraged me to be curious. That has been something that has stayed with me all of my life. Um, this is a strange sort of aspect of my story, and I kind of have learned to couch it a little bit, that uh, I was fortunate, although it was a terrible circumstance, that my father died when I was 14. Mm. Um, he died of cancer. And this was back in the days before there were the kind of treatments for cancer that we have in this day and age. The reason why I mention that is because I was allowed to experience his death as a natural part of life, not something that was separate not something that was um, hidden, but something that was just needing to be accepted. Now, was it challenging? You bet. Um, this was also in the late 1960s. So right. we were really going from um, the beaver, you know, leave it to beaver world right. into the early days of the Vietnam War. And my mother, um, and, and her parents, who were very influential in my life, my, my maternal grandfather in particular, um, were very much activists. And so I just kind of got rolled along into what then was a, um, a very politically active stance. Um, and I, I learned a few things by all of this. One, I learned how incredibly important it is to speak up and that nobody's gonna ask you your opinion. Uh, you can share your opinion in a way that can either influence or shut, your, shut somebody else down. But to speak up, to not speak up is really um, 
abdicating responsibility for taking care of our generation. Mm -hmm. I say that, Wendy, because so many of us feel these days, at least what's expressed to me, that we have been moved to the side. We become invisible and we're not speaking up, which is why I love the fact that you've got Hey Boomer! <laughs> an opportunity to, up. It, yeah, and, and to explore what is really an essential narrative, I think, for aging adults. We haven't been on this path before. Um, much of what we know about aging has been projected in terms of theory, but we're living it. We are mm -hmm. creating what will become pathways for those who follow us. And it's both frightening because there's not a lot of information out there that, that is accurate, but it also is exciting because we get to create a possibility that, that we've not lived before. Yeah, it really is kind of interesting when you think about our generation that we broke a lot of the barriers of being activists. And now we see a lot of the Gen Z population doing that as well, following in those footsteps. We broke a lot of the barriers for women in business and power. And now we are setting, we are the role models for what it means to age. So I think it's a lot of responsibility in some ways, but it also is an opportunity and you use the word curious. It's an opportunity to be curious and find our way and yeah. invent it how we want it. Yeah. And we need to keep having the conversation because things keep changing. Yeah. Pretty. I don't know if you noticed that or not. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. No. <laughs> Constantly like Instagram, right? Exactly. <laughs> Oh. Just when you think you got it. <laughs> so when you decided to retire, how long ago was that now? Oh, um, actually not all that long ago. So uh, maybe a year. Uh, oh, very recently. Okay. Yeah. But when you started thinking about that, that's when you got serious about your writing, your blogging. I, here's what actually happened. This is like true, true tale honest. I remember sitting across from uh, an 80 something year old who uh, would, this was before COVID and um, she was coming into my office. She had problems with family. Um, they're not really understanding her needs and her not really feeling connected. And I thought to myself, you know, I can work one-on-one -on -one and help her to establish a feeling of belonging one-on-one, -on -one. or I can start to take some of this stuff out to a larger audience. And I realized that what I was really being called to do was to leave the therapy room and go into a classroom or into some sort of a, a broadcast studio to share my ideas. There is no end of opportunity to talk about belonging and being connected mm -hmm. in this day and age of disconnection. Right. Uh, and the, the irony is not lost on me that we are using all of the technology and we are just absolutely brokenhearted as a species because we can't connect in an intimate, close, personal way anymore. Um, because of, because of the pandemic. Yes, yeah. because of the pandemic. Um, and the other distractions. I mean, I, I, one of the things that I have experienced, not only in private practice, but as I've lectured around the country, is people come up to me over and over and over and over and over and say, I feel invisible. I'm just not seen anymore. And it's not because there's not anything left to contribute. It's not because right. there isn't anything left to observe. It's that there's no invitation to participate mm -hmm. anymore. And I realize that it's not going to come in the mail. I have to go out and I have to create it. That's so um, learning this kind of medium um, has been actually quite enjoyable to me because it has given me opportunities that I never would have had uh, to yeah. connect in a variety of different groups in a variety of different ways with so much more 
um, flexibility. You know, I don't have to take a plane somewhere and rent a room and get a group Which together. Is- Right, which is nice. That's the that's that more intimate connection. But you're right, and I've heard that too, um, Mary. I've heard it from authors and um, you know people that were used to having a stage, a presence that they're they're feeling invisible now that they've retired. I wonder if uh, any of the people listening who have already retired are feeling some of that too, because it is an issue. You know, we do still have a lot to give. So yeah. Um, So you, so you took this on to, I have to now speak to a bigger audience. And, and so you started in a, a, I'm smiling because there's, you know, how things just seem to take root, but they don't see the light of day for a while. Um, At least that's been true in my life and flashback. Oh, probably close to 15 years ago. Um, I was teaching for an older adult program at a local junior college here. And they sent me over to one of these older facilities. And (laughs) I walked in just being, you know, well, yes, I'm the PhD and I know everything there is to know about aging. And I'm going to give you a lecture and all the rest of this. And they were, this group of people were just so very patient with me. Um, (laughs) And what ended up happening was this marvelous exchange of their lived experience in the United States in the early 1930s, the early 1940s, um, all through the McCarthy period. And we would come together every week and talk about an aspect of aging from the historic perspective, but how they were experiencing it now. Mm -hmm. And what it turned out to be was five pillars of aging. I, I learned from them, uh, I, I built on what my dissertation was on, which was on values and aging and, and how values, even though they may be implicit, mm-hmm. actually guide us in our decisions and what we make and who we are around in the, the people we associate with, um, the things that we choose to do and, and what we void. Because if it's not part of our value system, we tend not to pay any attention to it. So I started looking at spiritual values and how they underlay choices people make after retirement. How do you approach death? How do you decide um, what you're going to leave behind? Well, this was a wonderful conversation for these people who were there in their 60s and 70s and 80s who were facing this on a daily basis. And we would come together on a, every week and talk about some aspect of aging So we came up with five pillars, um, leaving a legacy of values. What does that mean? You know, we we spend so much time talking about giving away our things and the money and all the rest of that, but we're seeing this right now. We're seeing a conflict in values in this country and people who are, are not able to embrace value sets from others. And the conflict that that's bringing together is causing us distress in this nation. The second pillar is um, adaptation and accommodation. So this is what we need to do internally, changing our mind ideas about things, changing our approach to things, but also adapting our external environment to accommodate the changes that are going on within. Well, this was it's like taking a kid to a candy store. It's like, <laughs> do we need toys? Do we need to abandon? But it also it requires our societies adapting to having more and more aging adults who can continue to contribute. Right. The, the, the idea out there that you hit 65 and you become drooling, incontinent, and unable to contribute to anything more is way too prevalent. It's way too prevalent. We need to take a stand against that and say, no, wait a minute. I mean, not only do I have information to contribute and experience to contribute, I've got some pretty damn good ideas to contribute about how life should be. So staying engaged, it's one of your pillars of uh, 
say that yeah. too. Well, what, how do we stay engaged? Well, the physical is only one aspect of it. Cognitive is only one aspect of it. We have to stay engaged socially. And that, of course, has been the biggest challenge with COVID, is how do we re maintain these relationships and, and how do we build on them? I, one of the things I was laughing at the other day was I, I have a, a group um, that I do called uh, no, no Time Like the Present. And it really is just a way of uh, working through some pretty specific ideas about how to manage life. And um, one of the first groups I had on to do this, I think the mean age was like 78. Oh, wow. And none of them had any problem doing this. The technology. Yeah, none of them. None of them. And, you know, when I hear somebody say, oh, well, you know, you can't do TikTok or all the rest of it, it's like, I choose not to do TikTok. <laughs> right. There's a reason. <laughs> it's not that I don't know how to do it. I don't want to. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so, you know, that kind of staying engaged and, um, and, and dealing with the stereotypes, I think, is just absolutely essential for so many of us. This notion of having purpose and meaning in our mm -hmm. life, I think becomes even more important once we're done with the work world, because the, the socially acceptable reasons for being around and consuming uh, really go by the wayside. I'm, I'm seeing a greater need for the capacity that many of us have to reflect on our life and pull from it key ideas and then come up with ways to apply that to make the world a better place. That is, I see the absolute endure, enduring quest that we all have. We each have dark legacies. There's dark legacies of, of um, enslavement. There's dark legacies of incest. There's dark legacies of, I mean, you know, I can right. get psychological wounds. Uh, to no end. But what have we done with that? What our generation can do with that is bring it out of the shadow. The dark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the very last of the five pillars is, um, I, I call it emotional economics. And it's four statements. It's, I am enough. I have enough. There is enough. And I've defined what's good enough. And I see that challenge happening day in and day out, especially as we are experiencing our resources vacillating as much as they are at the moment. Um, it is absolutely essential to have a sense of self that is enduring, and not all of us do. So coming to terms with what does it mean to be enough in a world that doesn't necessarily value those things that I embody in terms of my age um, is a hard thing to to connect with and, and to approach. Yeah. And and in fact, that last one, I am enough. I have enough. I, I actually read about that in one of your books here and and journaled about that, because I think that's a really important one to recognize that you are enough. And that you have enough and that you are good enough and that you get to define that. I just, yeah. I think that's brilliant. And I think it's really cool that even though you were counseling primarily older adults for over 20 years, you found so much wisdom just in this group, in this nursing home. You know, it's like you were the receiver there instead of just the professional counselor giving the advice. So. Well, I, 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 yay, yes. And <laughs> isn't that really one of the greatest gifts that we can give ourselves is taking ourselves out of that need to be the expert and yeah. learning. In fact, in fact, <laughs> one of the things I wanted to, I, I wrote down several things from your book, um, uh, books, but there was a quote in one of these about asking for help, which has to do with being the expert, being the one in control. So I, I want to read that a little bit and then we can talk more about that. Okay. Um, <laughs> you say, my nature is to want to do everything myself. I don't want anybody thinking that I can't do things or that I am weak or that I am vulnerable. I want people to see me as strong and capable. 
I like being the person who helps other people. And that is definitely something I can relate to. So you go on, though, to talk about the rewards of asking for help. Yeah. Would you expand on that a little bit? It, it truly was one of the biggest ahas I'd ever had in my life. Um, I'm, I'm recalling the specific um, situation where this came up, where somebody told me uh, that I no longer had to be in charge. That, um, as a matter of fact, and this was what was so striking, I was actually stealing opportunities from other people by being responsible and taking charge of things. Hmm. And I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. What, how could I possibly be stealing something from them? And they, the lesson was, there is such joy in being able to share it with somebody else why wouldn't I let somebody receive that? Mm. Yes. Much of my capability and um, skill level has come about because I have made mistakes and learned from them. The secret there to me, Wendy, is creating situations that are safe enough to risk failing without the terrible consequences that some failures bring with them. Failures such as self-doubt, depression. You know, these physiological and psychological conditions, especially in a culture that does not tolerate failure like ours, makes it so hard for people who are older to continue to meet the level of performance and success that's required. Wouldn't it be marvelous if we could just sit at the feet of some wise person who says, you know, you don't have to struggle quite so hard. Mm -hmm. All you really need to do today is appreciate one or two things in your environment and say thank you. Mm -hmm. now, that sounds impossibly simplistic. But, oh, my God, try doing that. That's right. I, I know I used to try and write three gratitudes every night. and But sometimes you get so busy and so distracted or you get caught up in anger about something and it's hard to find three things. And there's a zillion things, really. But yeah. It's hard to find them sometimes. So you're right. Yeah, I love that. Um, another reality that you talk about with aging is losing some of our physical abilities, sometimes, you know, slowing, uh, certainly a slowdown of our cognitive abilities and, and a lower energy level. So this can be very frustrating for many of us who have been overachievers and doer, doer, doers. So what's your advice on how we can accept these changes as we are still recognizing we have a lot to give. We have a lot we want to continue to share and be engaged. You know, find something that has meaning for you um, and focus on that. It, uh, I guess I could be more specific about that. I, live in a 55 and older community out here in California and uh, used to be very, 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 very involved in um, the, the social aspect of the community I live in. My husband passed away and my status changed. I went from being a wife and a partner to being the odd person out. When that changed, my role changed. And so I, I had to figure out a way to continue to meet the needs that made me feel good, which was, you know, giving to people and staying in relationship with them, but do it in a different way. So I started to choose my friends differently and what I would do and when I would do it. 
Um, the physical challenges, um, boy, I can just. You've had I, some. I, I can run through a whole mess of them here. Now, I've, I've, I had COVID. Um, fortunately, it was mild. Um, I've had two hips replaced. I um, had an acoustic neuroma, so I'm a psychologist who had a brain tumor, hmm. lost my hearing, bad eyes. I mean, I could be a poster child for <laughs> all of the functional limitations you can imagine. I don't let them limit me. And that's a psychological, that's an attitudinal approach to things. There are things that I cannot do the same way I used to do them. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of where this notion of adaptation comes in and accommodation. And then there's some things that honestly I just don't want to do and I can use as an excuse because I don't feel like that. <laughs> but I have a conversation with myself around those things. I've tried not to limit myself out of fear or out of um, self-imposed limitations. When I find myself saying, well, I can't do that because of this, this, and this, I, I just, I just call myself on it, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, you know, you think for somebody who gave advice for all these years, I'd be able to give advice on it. But I, I find myself reluctant to do that until I get into conversation. And, and it, I would be that way with anybody. So, you know, if, if you are reluctant to go outside because of COVID, I think that's intelligent, frankly. <laughs> You know, um, there are too many people out there that are, that are just willing to risk things that they shouldn't be risking. On the other hand, if you're not going out because um, you're afraid that your life will be changed forever, then have a conversation with yourself about that fear. Well, like I wrote a, a blog about a leaf pile. I was with... I don't know if you read it. I was with my grandchildren over Thanksgiving and they had put this big pile of leaves together and they were jumping in the leaves. And I was like, oh, I, I want to jump in the leaves. So I did. And then I needed help getting up. Yeah. And I was like, what? You know, it was, it was like this shock to my system because no, I'm, you know, in your head, you're, you still think you're able to do all of these things. But I'm glad I did it and I would do it again. I would just do it differently so yeah. that I was more graceful in the way I went in and the way I came out. And, I, you know, I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's, it's, it's talking to yourself about what you can and can't do. I, I talk about accepting invitations all the time. And what I find is that I decline more invitations than I accept these days. Mm. And it's all up here. You know, it's like, oh, I don't want to go out because I'm tired. Oh, I don't want to do this because I'm this. Oh, I don't want to. I have to change that. I have to yeah, change you do. That, you know, because yeah. the, the isolation that has come across because of COVID um, really is taking a huge toll on us as humans, as a species, you know. Right to lose your husband and then go into COVID and the isolation is twice as hard. It's, but yes, going out, even in nature, I think just waving at people, smiling behind your mask in the grocery yeah. store, you know? Yeah. The I mean, other day I, I was, uh, I was going in into a store and I realized I, I hadn't put my mask on because I live alone. I don't, I don't think about putting my mask on it. You know, so, oh, I got to remember my mask. So. But I remember when I was working from home all the time and it was winter, Northern Virginia, cold, and I wouldn't see people for days. And then I'd say, I have to go to the grocery store just to have a conversation with the butcher. <laughs> really? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah, you do. Um, I have a couple of comments here. H Heidi says, we were talking about older uh, retired people feeling invisible. Heidi says older workers can feel invisible too. Um, Martha says it's, it's hard to give yourself the advice and she's enjoying this conversation. Um, a new friend of hers just started a group for those who lost husbands and partners. So that's a nice idea. Um, and she says, I love connecting with neighbors who are walking outside. And David said, 
I need to take can't out of my vocabulary. Oh, well done, sir. Yeah. Yes. Well done, David. <laughs> um, I wanted to go back to one of the five pillars, this legacy of values. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure I completely understand what that means. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> How so, am I going to do that? Yeah. Um, like I say, values are one of these implicit things. And, you know, values have enjoyed um, periods when we really paid attention to them and then they kind of disappeared. And the things that, that, okay, so let me be specific about this. The reason you are doing this broadcast is because you have a value of service. Now, you may not call that to mind, you know, it might just be such part and parcel of who you are that you don't even think twice about it. But then again, you would not think not twice about not doing it. That's a quadruple negative. Um, <laughs> How you connect with another human being is really based on where you position yourself in relationship to other people. Some people prefer not to have any conversation with anybody. Other people prefer to be at the front of the line. Okay? Those are values. When we get to this stage of life, the big decisions that are left in front of us are all about our values. Who do we spend time with? What is the quality of that time? What do we do with our things? And what purpose and meaning drive us every day in our life? Okay. So values of honesty, community, uh, values of showing up for people, values of preservation, the challenge in talking about values is that there's so many adjectives that, uh, and what I find actually really quite exciting about this is coming and getting very specific about what a value means to you. I believe in honesty, okay? Honesty is a useful skill, but there's some things that I don't talk about. Mm -hmm. So does that mean I'm not alignment with my values? No, it means that I need to explore what it means more. Um, we're seeing in our political lives right now, one of the biggest challenges around of, of who we are as a nation. That's all values based. Um, we talk about it in terms of, of party affiliation, but it really is about our belief systems and what we feel we should and should not be doing as a citizen. Um, I think one of the key issues that we face as aging adults is what kind of a death do we want to have? What, it, what is the role and function of death in our society? And that's a values-based conversation. This whole notion about whether, they're not, whether or not there should be euthanasia. Um, and, and the challenge that comes up for some people, the, the belief system that somehow they would be punished or um, choice right. would be taken away from them. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we tell people, no, you can't make a decision about your life. Somebody else is going to make that decision about your life. Right. And the whole hospice conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I think I'm hearing you say then that some of the work in this stage of our life is to really dig in and define what our values are so that we can live them as fully and honestly as possible and demonstrate them maybe as a legacy in the way that we show up. Is that what yes. you're saying? Thank you for being that clear. Yes. Well, 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 succinctly uh, put. <clears throat> I know that many of us were raised to um, give back. Mm -hmm. It's a key value. Right? What's changed in our lifetime is when and to whom. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So and how? Uh, say more. Is it financial? Is it time? Is it, ah. you know, things? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Those opportunities have expanded. <clears throat> right. Absolutely. <clears throat> so kind of the throat here. Um, at one point in my career, I was an estate planning paralegal. And I had many conversations with people about what to do with their things. Tangible personal property is, you know, <clears throat> what you do with your pens and pencils and paintings. And it always struck me as a little strange that people would spend so much time and money on things and not on values. Mm -hmm. What do I do with this life that I've led? How do mm -hmm. I want people to remember me? Do I need a statue? No, I don't need a statue. But I do want somebody to remember me, and which is why I wrote the books. And <clears throat> have access to maybe some of the mistakes I made. Learn from that because one of the values I have is that people shouldn't have to suffer unnecessarily. So sorry here. I have <clears throat> it's okay. <clears throat> I'll read you um, something while you're, if you have something <clears throat> to drink. Um, Jill says, and thank you, Jill. Um, she says, I really relate to the principle of being and having enough. The difference between discontent and real contentment. She says, my husband is fond of saying comparison is the thief of joy. Uh, Love he's that. He's a wise man. A wise, wise man, man, Jill. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we are coming towards the end. So let me, I mean, we could talk for another hour. Maybe we need to do a second show. But um, let me say that, you know, Hey Boomer, as you know, is about inspiring people to stay engaged with life, to find ways to make a difference. And I'm wondering, uh, and purpose, I'm wondering if there are two or three takeaways that you'd like to leave with the audience today. I think we need to ask the question of ourselves every single day, how can I make a difference in the world? Mm. Okay. Now, it doesn't have to be a big difference. It can it can be making somebody smile. And oh my right. God, in this day and age, oh, smiling is really good. Um, but it, it can be something larger. And, and this is where I'm seeing such a difference for us as boomers. Sacagawea, remember Sacagawea from yes, Lewis yeah. Clark and everything else? I love Sacagawea. <laughs> I always figured here come these two guys to kind of like, you know, looking for directions, kind of typical, <laughs> don't know where to go. And, and here's this woman who understands the territory unbelievably. And they come up to her and say, we, we, we want to go to the other side of town. And she says, okay, here's what you got to do. We've got to go on territory you've never been on before. We have to walk a certain distance every single day. And it's going to be uncomfortable for a while, but you'll like it when we get to the other side. You got to <laughs> trust me. And these guys do that. And what they come back with is this new frontier and a new way of looking at this territory. People have gotten old before. Methuselah got old. Okay? <laughs> What's different for us is the numbers of us who are getting old. That will give us the opportunity for creating unbelievable insight into what it means, not just to age, but to become valued participants in this thing called growing old. We do not need to accept the stereotype that we're going to be declining, that we're going to be retreating, and we're not going to be able to contribute anymore. I see us as providing an essential base for creating a whole new way to engage in a world that is vastly different from what our parents and grandparents encountered, mm -hmm. as yet familiar. And that's the challenge. That's so beautifully said. Thank you. I am so grateful <clears throat> to have you had have had you as a guest on the show today and as my last guest for 2021. Oh my. Wow. 
What a fabulous way to end the year. Um, and it's been a really good year for Hey Boomer. So I'm just so excited that I was able to have you on today. Um, I've been sharing ways that you can get in touch with Dr. Mary. It's Dr. or Dr. Mary Flett at gmail.com. And you can also reach her through the Center for Aging and Values.org, which also has a slew of wonderful other information besides how to reach Dr. Mary. So take a look at that. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in today. It, it has really been such a joy to bring Hey Boomer to all of you and to have all of you join me on this journey. And I'm excited to see where we go next year. I will be back on January the 10th. Not exactly sure who my guest is going to be for January 10th because the person that was booked changed his mind. So, um, <laughs> I will be juggling a little bit if anybody has a suggestion. Lots of thank yous um, from people that have uh, listened today, Mary. Thank you again. Thank you, Wendy. A, a delight. And I wish you much, much success with Hey Boomer. You are a delight to engage with. Oh, thanks. So are you. I appreciate it. We'll have to talk about uh, your comedy sometime, too. All right. <laughs> Sounds like a deal. Happy holidays to all of your viewers. And, and many blessings through the season. Thank you. And remember, we are never too old to set another goal or dream a new dream. My name is Wendy Green, and this has been Hey Boomer.